Stanford University. Please welcome the class of 2023.
class of 2023, please take your seats.
Please rise for the president's party.
Welcome to Stanford University's 132nd Annual Commencement. Here at Stanford, it is our tradition to begin all communal celebrations with an acknowledgement of the land on which we stand and the peoples who steward it. Please welcome Lacey Kalak Dunn, Class of 2023, for this sacred recognition. We invite you to remain standing for the land acknowledgement and the invocation that follows. Miu Yum, Miu Yum, greetings all. No tongue, Lacey Kalak Dun, Yaka. I am Lacey Kalak Dun. No Kiam Washkangai. I am a proud citizen of the Rincon Band of Luceno Indians of San Diego and a Pitt River and Chickasaw lineal descendant. Stanford sits on the ancestral land of the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. Consistent with our values of community and inclusion, we have a responsibility to acknowledge, honor, and make visible the university's relationship to Native people. Noshan Lovic, thank you. In that spirit of blessing, I invite us to be together. Pausing amid our celebrations, we await the culmination of our time here. But let us not hurry this moment. Let us stay with it, be present to it. Breathe. Allow the relief and release and the joy and the jubilee to wash over us as we honor not simply what we have done, but who we have become. In this sacred time between the past and the future, remind us of the passionate pursuits that brought us here and the new possibilities that call us forward. Renew in us a common love for humanity, ever expanding the radius of our empathy to enfold even those with whom we deeply disagree. And grant that we might recognize our potential, known in the fullness of who we are beyond classroom and career, the power lying deep within, forged through fires of struggle and resilience, a steadfast hope and spirited determination that propels us beyond self-doubt to acknowledge the truth of who we are. Bright, brilliant, beloved, perfect and enough, just as we are. So graduates, breathe. When this moment ends, may we turn toward the future unafraid with open hearts and outstretched arms, never losing faith in our power to create a world marked by peace, justice, and compassion beyond measure. Amen. You may be seated. Well, thank you, Dean Steinwert. Graduates, Stanford faculty and staff, former and current trustees of our university, distinguished guests, and cherished family members and friends. I thank you for joining us on this very special day to celebrate Stanford's 132nd commencement. It's my honor to warmly welcome all of you to Stanford this morning. To those of you who are receiving degrees today, I offer a special welcome, our senior class members and our graduate students. Congratulations to each and every one of you on your impressive accomplishments. <laughs> to
Today, Today we celebrate we your achievements during your time at Stanford, and we look ahead with anticipation to everything you will do next. I'd like to begin by asking all of you to join me in thanking everyone who has made today's celebration possible, including the groundskeepers, ushers, event planners, and crew, as well as those who are working our cameras and our live stream to make it possible for us to share this celebration with those who can't be here in person today. Thank you all. <laughs> 2023 graduates, we are so proud of all that you have achieved during your time at Stanford and of all the hard work and dedication that has brought you to today. Today, we will award 1,075 doctoral degrees, 2,503 master's degrees, and 1,580 bachelor's degrees. Of those students receiving bachelor's degrees, 279 will graduate with university distinction, and 315 will graduate with both a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. These numbers reflect the hard work of students from around the globe. 251 members of our undergraduate class hail from 74 countries, and 1,634 graduate students come from 113 countries. The numbers I've cited illustrate both your extraordinary accomplishments here at Stanford, and also your great potential to have a positive impact on our world. Graduates, our faculty and staff have dedicated themselves to nurturing that potential in each of you. I'd like to take this moment to thank them for their support and encouragement throughout your time at Stanford. Thank you to the faculty and staff. Your accomplishments are also due in part to the dedication, to the loving encouragement, and to the extraordinary support of the family members and friends who have championed each of you in your years as you worked toward your Stanford degree and at Stanford. Many of those family members and friends are here today in the stands of our stadium. Others are watching the ceremony from around the world. They include your mothers and your fathers, spouses and children, your grandparents, aunts and uncles, your mentors and your peers, people who helped you along the way to Stanford and through your years at Stanford. And so I'd like to ask all of our graduates, both our seniors and our graduate students, to join now in one of Stanford's cherished commencement traditions. Please rise if you are able. Please rise. Think of all the family members and friends who supported you on this special journey. Turn to your family members and friends if they're in the stands. And please join me in saying these words to them Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> to the family members and friends of our Stanford graduates, I say thank you as well. Thank you for entrusting your loved ones to our university and their time here. And thank you for all that you have done to help ensure their success. Please be seated. And now, it's my pleasure to turn the program over to Stanford's Provost, Persis Drell, who will present the winners of the University Awards. It is now my privilege and pleasure to present the following prizes. The President's Award for the Advancement of the Common Good, the Walter J. Gores Awards for Excellence in Teaching, the Lloyd W. Dinkelspiel Awards, and the Kenneth M. Cuthbertson Awards. Recommendations for these awards were considered by a committee of faculty, students, and staff, the President's Award for the Advancement of the Common Good was established just last year. This award honors alumni who exemplify 
the university's mission and values, and who demonstrate a commitment to learning, social responsibility, and ethical and effective service. I would like to ask the award recipients to come forward at this time. The recipients of the 2023 President's Award for the Advancement of the Common Good are Diane Calvi, Bachelor's 84, and Ray Saldana, Bachelor's 09, Master's 10. On, on, on behalf of the university, I congratulate this, you for this significant recognition of your contributions to the greater good of society. Thank you. The Gores Awards were established by a bequest from Walter J. Gores, a Stanford alumnus of the class of 1917, and recognize excellent teaching at the undergraduate and the graduate level. I would like to ask the recipients to come forward now, and I ask that you hold your applause, please, until I have announced all of the, this year's award winners. The recipients of the 2023 Walter J. Gores Awards for Excellent in in Excellence in Teaching are Thomas S. Mullaney, Professor of History, L Lakshmi Balasubramanian, Lecturer in the Graduate School of Education, a Amanda Liu, PhD in Education Policy, and Sophie Libkind, PhD candidate in mathematics. On behalf of our university, I congratulate each of you for this recognition of the excellence in your teaching. I would now like to ask the Dinkelspiel Award winners to come forward at this time. Lloyd Dinkelspiel's service to Stanford included the presidency of the Board of Trustees in the 1950s and was characterized by an enduring concern for the quality of undergraduate education. The recipients of the 2023 Lloyd W. Dinkelspiel Award for Distinctive Contributions to Undergraduate Education are Marvin Diogenes, the Director of the Program in Writing and Rhetoric and Writing in the Major and Associate Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education, Lernik Assyrian, Lecturer, Department of Mathematics, and Frankie Mahalan Serfenik, Co-Terminal Student in Computer Science. On, on behalf of the university, I congratulate you for this significant recognition of your contributions to undergraduate education. Our next award is the Kenneth M. Cuthbertson Award for Exceptional Service to Stanford University. I would like to ask the Cuthbertson Award winners to come forward at this time. The award was established in 1981 to honor the late Kenneth Cuthbertson one of the early architects of Stanford's long-range financial planning and development programs. The sole criterion of this award is the quality of the contribution that the recipient has made to Stanford. The recipients of the 2023 
Kenneth M. Cuthbertson Award for exceptional contributions to Stanford University are B. Howard Pearson, lecturer, Stanford Law School, senior philanthropic advisor and development legal counsel for the university, and Stephanie Calfion, vice provost for academic affairs. On behalf of the university, I congratulate you for this distinguished recognition of your exceptional service to Stanford. Well, thank you, Provost Durrell. And on this occasion of your final commencement as Stanford's provost, please accept my thanks for your service to the university we're all so grateful for your wisdom, your energy, your steady leadership, and your dedication to our university. Our students have been fortunate to have you at the helm of our academic mission through your years um, and their years uh, at Stanford. Thank you very much. <laughs> Graduates. Today we celebrate everything you accomplished during your time at Stanford, and we look with anticipation to your path ahead. We're so proud of your hard work and many achievements, and I hope you savor this day of celebration. Your time here has also laid a strong foundation for the lives and the careers you will build as you leave this part of your education behind and move to the next step of your own journey. Your years here have been marked by transformation, your own personal transformation and growth, as well as great changes in the world around us. Many of you were in your first year on campus when the COVID shutdown happened. We all learned how drastically the world can change in an instant. But you also learned through that experience, the perseverance and the strength of character that each of you have within yourselves. You adapted. You found new ways to pursue intellectual exploration, perform service work, and build community. You discovered new ways to connect with friends and peers, professors and mentors. You each learned more about yourself, about your own strength of character, and about your ability to achieve your own goals and aspirations even as the world changes around you. Now, as you leave Stanford and go out into the wider world, that perseverance and adaptability and the passion, the skills, and the knowledge that you fostered throughout your time here will serve you well. During your time at Stanford, you've done the important work of discovery in the classroom, in the library or laboratory, in our community and in communities around the world. Wherever you go next, you will bring that knowledge and those skills. They will provide a terrific foundation for your career and will no doubt inform your day-to-day -day work. But our word, world needs more than your skill set, and our world needs more than your knowledge. As much as the world needs your talent, it also needs your empathy. As much as our world needs your passion, it also needs your compassion. The world needs your hearts as well as your minds. We need young people who participate in the life of their communities, who think about the impact of their work on the broader world, and who work creatively to solve challenges and build a better future for all of us. Those also are things that you've learned during your years at Stanford. And you will take that empathy and that compassion with you along the next step of your journey. Before you leave Stanford and go out into the wider world, I'd like to share three thoughts with you. First, I encourage you to connect with others with empathy and humanity, both those you agree with and those you do not. At Stanford, you've engaged with ethical and social problems in the classroom. But as you leave Stanford, you are entering a divided world, a world with many challenging problems. In order to make progress on solving those challenges, you'll need to hear and understand a diversity of perspectives. None of us knows it all. 
None of us has every answer or is right on every issue. To make real impact, you will need to engage in productive conversation and to find areas of compromise, even with people you strongly disagree with. You're all up to the task. Each of you, during your time at Stanford, has had the opportunity to engage with your fellow students, with faculty, and with staff. You've had the opportunity to learn from people around you who hail from many different backgrounds and who embrace diverse perspectives. This doesn't mean you shouldn't hold firm to your own convictions and principles, you should. But you also need to allow space for new information and new perspectives. Listen to others and allow yourself the flexibility to evolve as you learn more about the world and more about yourself. Second, I urge you to continue to follow your interests and to remain open to new paths. I'm sure many of you arrived at Stanford with a plan for how your future would look, and I'm equally sure that for most, if not all of you, that, has, that plan has changed during the course of your years here in ways large or small. The world will continue to change and evolve, and you along with it will continue to grow and change and evolve. During your time at Stanford, you gain the tools and knowledge you will need to navigate these twists and turns, these evolutions and disruptions. You have the tools you need to continue to take risks, to travel unfamiliar roads, and to explore your interests. So don't leave exploration behind you at Stanford. Dedicate yourself to continuing to learn and to grow. It will lead you to surprising and inspiring places. Third, I encourage you to find your own way to make a difference. Think about how you can use your talents not only to further your own career, but to make a difference for people beyond you. Our world has many, many problems that need to be solved, but real change requires dedicated work from all of us. We need your talents, your creativity, and your commitment to improving our world if we're going to find solutions to the challenges we face and make our world better. Each of you has that in you. We've seen it throughout your years at Stanford. Take A.C. King, who combined her love for computer science, who, who combined her love for computer science and drawing comics to create a book that teaches kids how to code. Or Sean Casey, who worked with friends to make Democracy Day an official academic holiday at Stanford and to enhance civic engagement here on campus. Kellen Vu was a leader in transitioning an English language learning program for Stanford service workers to a virtual format during the pandemic. And all of you sitting here today on this field have made a difference during your time here. Whether you participated in cardinal service, worked as an RA or as a member of student government, or simply dedicated yourself to brightening the days of the people around you, you've all left your mark on our university. As you leave Stanford and go out into the world, I hope you continue to take your own unique blend of talents and passion and use them to make a difference. Your dedication to others, combined with your unique skills and knowledge, can make our world better. And that brings me to another member of our Stanford community who has used his platform and his own unique skills to make a difference, today's commencement speaker, John McEnroe. John McEnroe is a tennis legend. He dominated the world of tennis in the late 1970s and the 1980s. He was ranked number one in the world from 1981 to 1984. He won 77 career singles titles, including seven Grand Slam titles, three Wimbledon championships, and four US Open championships. He also won 78 doubles titles, including 10 Grand Slam titles, and helped lead the US to five Davis Cup championships. As a first-year student at Stanford, he helped lead the men's tennis team to the NCAA team title in 1978. In fact, this spring is the 45th anniversary of that remarkable championship. John won the NCAA individual singles title that same year before turning pro. He played for legendary Stanford tennis coach Dick Gould, who described him as, quote, the best athlete I ever had and a genius with a racket. He is best known for his tennis prowess, as well as for the competitive 
and at times outspoken spirit he brings to the sport. But John McEnroe has also had a long career with many twists and turns. He's reinvented himself several times over, adapting to changes in his life and career, just as each of you will need to do in your lives. He's been a broadcaster, a multiple sports Emmy, Emmys winner, a best-selling author, an actor, and a voice actor. He's also been a philanthropist, a musician, an art gallery owner, and an art collector. Many of you know him from the popular Netflix series, Never Have I Ever, in which he narrates the inner thoughts of an Indian American teenage girl. John has described the role as an opportunity to get outside his comfort zone, and he's been called the perfect spiritual match for Davy, the hot-headed protagonist. John McEnroe has also used his passion and his talents to be of service to others. He founded the Johnny Mac Tennis Project to transform young lives by removing the economic, racial, and social barriers to success in tennis. The project offers an accessible pathway into the sport for kids living in under-resourced areas. It introduces tennis as a lifelong health, fitness, and social activity, and it provides a pathway for student athletes that can lead to college scholarships and successful careers. John McEnroe provides a wonderful example of the many paths you can take over the course of a career and how you can use your talent and skill set to make the world brighter. Please join me in welcoming John McEnroe. Wow, thank you. I don't see like I used to, so I got to put these on. Great crowd. Oh, wow. Huh. It's more people here than the football games this year. <laughs> thank you, MTL, for that nice introduction, and thank you to the senior class presidents for inviting me to speak. You're all officially badasses in my book. Thank you. Most of all, to Stanford's class of 2023, congratulations, you did it. You're officially overachievers. Well done. I mean, it is an absolute honor to be here, especially given that it's Father's Day. Uh, I never got to walk in cap and gown, so technically, this is my graduation too. I know that my father, if he were alive, would be one of the proudest people in the stadium. I can't imagine a better Father's Day gift than watching your, your kid graduate from this incredible school. To all you dads and moms out there who sacrificed so your child could attend Stanford, well done. <laughs> to those parents had to put just one kid through college, consider yourself lucky. I'm the father of six college graduates. You can appreciate my pain. The McEnroe family has a long history with this fine institution. I attended for one year. My two younger brothers graduated from here. We bleed cardinal red through and through. But I do have a bone to pick with Stanford. In March, I get the invite to be your commencement speaker. While I'm busy figuring out my flights to San Jose, my youngest daughter tells me she was rejected to Stanford Law School. She says to me, Dad, you're not going to give that speech, are you? They rejected me. They rejected my cousin, your nephew, and every other person you've ever written a recommendation letter for. Dad, you cannot be serious! I had to throw that one in. Just as I was about to boycott, I found out I would be the first professional athlete ever to speak at Stanford commencement. And I thought, this is, this is a big deal. Not just for me, but for the school and for sports. Some phenomenal athletes have graced this institution. Here's a fun fact. Stanford has won more NCAA team championships than any other school. 
So it's a, it's about damn time they invited the bad boy of tennis to this stage. And don't worry, my daughter got into NYU. She gets to live in the greatest city in the world instead of slumming it here in Palo Alto. The funny thing is, I almost never came to Stanford. The summer before my freshman year, my life completely changed. I was in the semifinals of Wimbledon. That was unheard of at the time. Everyone was telling me to turn pro and not to bother with college. But I felt like I wasn't mature enough, not ready. I wanted the college experience and to just be a kid for one more year. Plus, I wanted to be part of a team. That's one of the reasons I love playing doubles. By the way, my kids absolutely cringe every time I make tennis analogies. But fair warning, you're going to hear a lot of them in this speech. It could be worse. You could be listening to some lame-ass politician telling you how great they are. Back to the analogies. For most of your life as a tennis player, you're out there alone. For better or for worse, it's just you. And that can be terrifying. So when you get those opportunities to be part of something bigger than yourself, take them. Trust me, succeeding as a team can be as fun as doing it alone. As mentioned, at Stanford, I was lucky enough to do both. I won the singles title and was part of the 1978 undefeated NCAA championship team under the leadership of the legendary Dick Gould, who is with us here today somewhere. That man won 17 NCAA team titles, not too shabby. The respect of your peers is the ultimate achievement, and Dick has it. He gave me great advice, but none of it was about tennis. When someone is at the top of their game, it's best to stay out of their way. That's one of the gifts of a great coach. I thought I'd be a hot shot when I arrived at Stanford. I thought all the girls would love me, and all the guys would want to be me. But as it turned out, no one gave a shit. <laughs> Everyone was busy trying to change the world in their own way. They are off building computers in garages and developing tech that would later transform every aspect of our lives. I was just a tennis player. But the atmosphere here made me hungrier for success. I was humbled a lot in my first quarter. My academic advisor had the bright idea that I take advanced calculus, economics, astronomy, and a ridiculously tough English course. I spent all my time studying and wasn't having nearly enough fun. But I loved li living at Rinconada, <laughs> hanging out at Stern, and spent a lot of my time at the old DU house, where I took part in certain activities that would open my mind a lot more than my classes. I met some guys who advised me to take easy courses so I wouldn't stress out too much. Thank you, Kenny Margarine, Marjoram, and the rest of the football team. My favorite course was maybe parapsychology and psychic phenomenon. The high point of that class was how our professor showed us how you could bend a spoon with your mind. And I believed it. On this campus, I began to step outside myself and see that there was life beyond tennis and academics. Later on, passions like art and music enriched my life in ways I never imagined. So know this, absolutely amazing things are going to happen to you that you can't possibly fathom right now. Because just like I was at your age, at your age you're probably hyper-focused on your career. If someone had told me all those years ago when I was leaving Stanford that I would one day get guitar lessons from the late, great Eddie Van Halen, or that most of you would know me not from tennis, but from a sitcom about an Amer Indian-American girl on Netflix, 
I would have said you're crazy and what's Netflix? <laughs> By the way, the final season of Never Have I Ever has just dropped out last week. That's what's known as a shameless plug. Everyone wants a great career, but don't miss your life on the way to work. Work-life balance may seem impossible, but it's worth pursuing. It took me a long time to learn that lesson. Like many of you enterprising go-getters, I too am a perfectionist. It's not all our fault. Growing up, almost everything I did didn't, just didn't quite seem to be enough. I was 12 years old when I first felt undue pressure from my dad regarding my potential future with tennis. I finally asked my parents, what would make you happy? My father said, a college scholarship and playing for your country. I told them, well, Dad, I'm 12. <laughs> Could you back off for a few years? In that moment, I learned no matter who it is, you have to be able to stand up for yourself. Whether it's your father or your boss, be your own best advocate. Dad, have I made it yet? What's that? He just told me he likes Steve Jobs' speeches better. <laughs> in sports, you often hear the phrase, winning is everything. But in reality, it's not. The questions you have to answer are, am I getting better as a person? And is what I'm doing bringing me and the ones around me happiness? The answers will tell you whether or not you're really winning. After you succeed at something, you expect the skies to open and happiness to rain down on you. But that rarely happens. The truth is victory can be isolating. A lot of it comes down to how you handle pressure. A week or so ago, I was in Paris covering the French Open, watching two guys trying to make sports history. There was Carlos Alcaraz, a kid younger than most of you, ranked number one in the world, on the verge of taking over the tennis world when he completely froze. He cramped up physically and mentally. The pressure became too much. I thought this could be life-altering for him. He's got to figure out a way to handle pressure. And I think he will. And I would know. I've been there. Guess what? In your own life, you're all going to be there, too. And as the high achievers that you are, the worst pressure is the kind you feel internally. Many questions will keep you up at night. Am I good enough? Am I where I should be? I went to Stanford. Why did I not make partner yet? Well, maybe you should have gone to NYU. <laughs> <laughs> My dear friend, the great Billie Jean King, will tell you pressure is a privilege. The first time I heard that, I thought she was nuts. Pressure's not a privilege, it's awful. But upon further reflection, I realize she has a point. We're lucky to experience pressure at the highest levels. Don't forget, a lot of people would kill to be in your seats right now. To get here, you had to handle serious pressure. You're the generation that had your college experience interrupted by a COVID lockdown. The disappointment, the isolation, stress, and alienation must have been devastating. As students, you pivoted to virtual options. Maybe you took a gap year, found other ways to connect with your peers and your teachers, but the point is you kept moving forward, coming out a little stronger on the other side. I imagine quarantine forced your brilliant minds to do some pretty deep thinking, and this experience will probably inspire and shape your generations in ways we haven't yet realized. There'll be innovations, treatments, cures, knowledge and relationships that will evolve from this experience. Suffice to say, you adapted to hard times and you're here now as graduates, yes. And that is big. Don't forget the lesson here. Life doesn't always go as planned and sometimes you need to pivot. And the path you end up on can be better than anything you ever imagined. 
If you know anything about my tennis career, you probably know that I didn't exactly handle pressure in the way people expect. <laughs> Google John McEnroe meltdown, and you'll see many YouTube clips of me smashing rackets and shouting choice words at umpires. I'm not proud of it. Okay, I am a little proud of it. <laughs> what can I say? It kind of worked. The press ate it up, and still to this day, random people come up to me on the street and ask me to yell at them. <laughs> but I wasn't intentionally trying to be a jerk. I was competing at the highest levels, and I was releasing pressure the only way I knew how, like a valve releasing steam. But there is a better way, trust me. For the longest time, I was not very empathetic to others, and that was probably my biggest flaw. I was wired to win and never let up, not even for a second. I felt like I couldn't enjoy the moment, and worse yet, I was often insensitive to the people around me. I had that edge about me. Again, not a great way to live. But I was lucky that new doors opened in my life, which allowed me to find happiness in unexpected ways. I got really into art, made some incredible friendships, built a family, and met the love of my life, my beautiful wife, Patty, up there. Yeah. If I allowed myself to be defined by tennis, I wouldn't be half as interesting. I probably wouldn't be here right now, and I would very likely be very unhappy. You're the sum of your whole life, not your professional accomplishments. So start enjoying your life now. Don't wait till your career takes off. As a society, in large part because of your generation, we have come to understand and respect the importance of mental health. It needs to be nurtured in the way we take care of every aspect of our body. In my lifetime, I've seen about 37 therapists, and not all of them were court appointed. Let's just say I had a couple issues to work out. I'm not alone. Across politics, sports, and entertainment, public figures have been more open about the benefits of therapy, stepping away and taking a break. I think that's healthy and important. I benefited from it. Good mental health is connected to physical activity. Move a muscle, change your thought. For all the positive steps, though, that we've seen in caring for our mental health, we're also seeing the flip side, where people are attempting to eliminate stress or pain altogether, which is impossible. It's the uh, everyone gets a trophy kind of mentality. It's ridiculous and honestly, to me, a little dangerous. Not everyone is meant to be good at everything. And it's very important for people to realize and very important for people who are high-flying mental giants like all of you to realize taking risks, failing, and learning from your failures is essential to your development. And sometimes a loss is the best thing that can happen to you. In 1980, Bjorn Borg and I played in what is considered one of the greatest Wimbledon finals of all time. After three hours and 53 minutes of some seriously intense tennis, I lost in five sets. Of course I wanted to win. I gave it everything I had, but I wouldn't trade that moment for anything. The truth is, most people don't even remember who won that match and don't care. I once had the privilege of meeting the great Nelson Mandela. He told me he listened to that match on a tiny radio from his prison cell on Robben Island, and that the whole prison hung on every point of that match that we gave, we gave Mandela a brief respite from the excruciating hell of 27 years of political imprisonment meant more to me than any award I've ever won. The lesson here is you don't have to win to be part of something that is truly magical. A few years after that Wimbledon final, Bjorn quit tennis at age 26. It was devastating to me and the rest of the sport. In the mid-80s, if you were in my path, I would destroy you. 
top of my game, but I wasn't truly happy. Why? Because being the best in the world wasn't as good as playing with someone who pushed you to greatness, which is why I begged my biggest rival to come back to the sport. At the time, he said to me, if you're not number one, John, it doesn't matter if you're number two or number 100. Even though I understood where he was coming from, I disagreed with him then and still do. Number two is pretty damn good. Sometimes you have to appreciate where you're at in life. If your mentality is if it's not success, then it's failure, your life will be really, really hard. Success gives us another chance to keep plugging away at we, what we love to do. That's all it really is. For, for a while, I feared I might be the guy who peaked in life at age 26 or 7. When you look at the last few years of my tennis career or my failed talk show or the end of my first marriage or all the various projects that came and went, I stayed in it. I kept trying new things, opening new doors. I learned not to be disillusioned by failure, not to be burdened by perfection, and not to be intimidated by greatness. My final tennis analogy is this. When a ball is coming at you, you have a split second to decide how to return it. You have a handful of options and make the best decision in the moment. Sometimes you win the point, and sometimes it's an endless rally that you lose. But you take your best shot and keep finding the courage to step on the court. Graduates, this is the time to take your shots. Your life will go by fast. Give it your all. Stand up for yourself. Stay curious. Be a good citizen of the world. Don't get crushed under the weight of your own expectations. Know that the real victory in life is the long game. Measure your success by how much you evolve, not necessarily how much you win. Don't be afraid to make mistakes, and for Christ's sakes, have the balls to say what you feel. There's a quote emblazoned on a wall at Wimbledon right before you enter center court. It's from Kipling's poem, If. It reads, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. Kipling's point is that one person's victory is another one's defeat. Win or lose, what matters is giving everything you've got. In a truly full life, you'll be lucky to have your share of both victories and defeats. In either case, keep finding the courage within you to move forward. Congratulations, class of 2023. I wish you the greatest life imaginable. Thank you very much for having me. And I love the tennis outfits, by the way. Unbelievable. That's going at him. Well, thank you so much, John, for those heartfelt remarks. We really appreciate your being part of this celebration today and imparting all that wisdom to our graduates. And now, will the provost please present the candidates for degrees? Mr. President, first, I have the honor to recognize all those who have completed the requirements for master's and doctoral degrees. They will be presented to you by the deans of their schools. Will the candidates from the School of Engineering please stand if you are able?
Thank you, Dean Widom. Mr. President, I present to you those who have completed the requirements for the degrees of Master of Science, Engineer, and Doctor of Philosophy. Thank you. By the authority vested in me by the faculty and trustees of this university, I am delighted to confer publicly upon you the degrees for which you've been presented and to admit you to their rights, responsibilities, and privileges. Congratulations. Will the graduates from the School of Engineering please be seated? Will the candidates from the School of Law please stand if you are able? <laughs> Mr. President, I present to you those who have completed the requirements for the degrees of Doctor of Jurisprudence, Master of Laws, Master of the Science of Law, and Doctor of the Science of Law. Thank you, Dean Martinez. By the authority vested in me by the faculty and trustees of this university, I am delighted to confer publicly upon you the degrees for which you've been presented and to admit you to their rights, responsibilities, and privileges. Congratulations. Will the graduates from the School of Law please be seated? Will the candidates from the Graduate School of Education please stand, if you are able? Very good. Mr. President, I present to you those who have completed the requirements for the degrees of Master of Arts, Masters of Science, and Doctor of Philosophy. Thank you, Dean Schwartz. By the authority vested in me by the faculty and trustees of this university, I'm delighted to confer publicly upon you the degrees for which you've been presented and to admit you to their rights, responsibilities, and privileges. Congratulations. Will the graduates from the School of Education please be seated? Will the candidates from the School of Humanities and Sciences please stand if you are able? <laughs> Mr. Mr. President, I present to you those who have completed the requirements for the degrees of Master of, of Arts, Master of Fine Arts, Master of Liberal Arts, Master of Public Policy, Master of Science, Doctor of Musical Arts and Doctor of Philosophy. Thank you, Dean Satz. By the authority vested in me by the faculty and trustees of this university, I am delighted to confer publicly upon you the degrees for which you've been presented and to admit you to their rights, responsibilities, and privileges. Congratulations. Will the graduates from the School of Humanities and Sciences please be seated? Will the candidates from the Stanford Door School of Sustainability please stand if you're able? Mr. President, I present to you those who have completed the requirements for the degrees of Master of Arts, Master of Science, and Doctor of Philosophy. Thank you, Dean Majumdar, and may I welcome you to your first commencement as Dean of the Stanford Door School of Sustainability. <laughs> by the authority vested in me by the faculty and trustees of this university, I am delighted to confer publicly upon you the degrees for which you've been presented and to admit you to their rights, responsibilities, and privileges. 
congratulations to the inaugural class of graduates from the Stanford Door School of Sustainability. Will the graduates from the Stanford Door School of Sustainability please be seated. Will the candidates from the Graduate School of Business please stand if you are able. <laughs> Mr. President, I present to you those who have completed the requirements for the degrees of Master of Arts in Business Research, Master of Science in Management, Master of Business Administration and Doctor of Philosophy. Well, thank you, Dean Levin, and congratulations on your continued popularity. By the authority vested in me by the faculty and trustees of this university, I'm delighted to confer pub publicly upon you the degrees for which you've been presented and to admit you to their rights, responsibilities, and privileges. Congratulations. Will the graduates from the School of Business please be seated? Will the candidates from the School of Medicine please stand if you're able. <laughs> Mr. President, I present to you those who have completed the requirements for the degrees of Master of Science in Physician Assistant Studies, Master of Science, Doctor of Philosophy, and Doctor of Medicine. Thank you, Dean Minor. By the authority vested in me by the faculty and trustees of this university, I am delighted to confer upon you the degrees for which you've been presented and to admit you to their rights, responsibilities, and privileges. Congratulations. Will the graduates from the School of Medicine please be seated? Well, Mr. President, have we forgotten anyone? Uh, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so oh, either. Oh, wait, 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 wait. The undergraduate degrees. Oh, of course. That's right. Now, Mr. President, I have the honor to recognize all of those who have completed the requirements for undergraduate degrees. Will the recipients of the degrees of Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Science, and Bachelor of Arts and Science please stand if you are able. Mr. President, Mr. President, uh, uh. Mr. President, I present to you those who have completed the requirements for the Bachelor of Arts and the Bachelor of Science degrees and the Bachelor of Arts and Science degrees. By the authority vested in me by the faculty and trustees of this university, I'm delighted to confer upon each of you the bachelor degree and to admit you to its rights, responsibilities, and privileges. Congratulations.
Will the graduates please be seated? Um. Well, thank you, Provost Drell. Graduates, on behalf of Stanford University, congratulations to you on this very special day. You've graduated from the family of Stanford students, and you've joined the family of Stanford alumni. From this day forward, wherever you go in the world, whatever path you explore and whatever contribution you seek to make, you will remain forever cardinal and forever a part of the Stanford community. As you go out into the world, you have the extraordinary opportunity to use not only your skills and your knowledge, but also your empathy and your compassion to solve the challenges we face. As you take the next steps along your journey, I urge you to connect with others with openness, to continue to learn and explore, and to commit yourself to making real change for humanity and for our planet. I believe in each of you, and I believe in your ability to create a bright future for yourself, for your community, and for our world. Congratulations, class of 2023. And now, please rise if you're able for the Stanford hymn and the benediction. Yesterday, at baccalaureate, Luciana Gomez urged us to remember all of our moments are of value, our successes and our failures, all are priceless. So after, after the sounds of celebration have passed, when the joyous cries of today have ceased, when you have driven away down Palm Drive that final time, when you find yourself in a quiet moment of stillness, may you listen closely and hear the still small voice that is softly speaking Hear it, whispering only loud enough for your heart to hear. It is saying, remember who you are. It is saying, all you need is already within you. Grow, 
So listen, and may the voice, your inner voice, nourish you, sustain you, and keep you balanced and upright. And as you move beyond this campus and into the world, go and just be, to live out your precious, priceless life. And may you live it, and live it fiercely. Amen. 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 Ashe. Ashe. And Amin. Amin.
For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.